The following program is a production of Pioneer Public Television. It's a lot easier to maneuver than a canoe, and you can really get in some really interesting places with it. And the longer you're into no-till, the easier it gets. By year three, you won't even recognize your farm anymore. You know, I never did tell you that my family crest is a megaphone. Did I ever tell you that? That's, yeah, it's hard to believe, you know, as shy and quiet as I am. Funding for this program was provided by the Minnesota Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund, Safe Basements of Minnesota, your basement waterproofing and foundation repair specialist since 1990. Peace of mind is a safe basement. Diamond Willow Advanced Care Assisted Living, providing custom homes with smaller settings designed especially for high care needs. Live Wide Open telling stories of why people have chosen to live wide open in West Central Minnesota. More at livewideopen.com. Western Minnesota Prairie Waters, quietly beautiful and wildly connected. Spending time in the outdoors has a way of easing the day-to-day -day burdens people are saddled with. Whether it's climbing 12 feet off the ground and being tethered to a tree or relaxing in a 17-foot aluminum boat waiting to feel a tug on the end of your line. Each year, over 1 million men, women, and children purchase a license to fish in Minnesota. While most people enjoy a meal of fresh fish, the harvest isn't always what anglers seek when they take to the water. Each person has a different way of connecting with the activity. And exploring the ethical and legal options available can be a rewarding experience. Welcome to Prairie Sportsman, I'm Brett Amundsen. And when you go fishing in Minnesota, you've got a lot of options for species of fish to fish for, and even more options when it comes to destinations to fish at. But sometimes, it doesn't matter where you go, but how you do it when you get there. Oh, to me, it's the most sporting way of fishing. I, uh, I like to fly fish because it's, uh, I mean, I make bone flies, I, uh, I build most bone rods. When I was about 10 years old, a neighbor of mine had, was dying of lung cancer, and I did his chores for him, and he gave me, uh, to thank me, he gave me his fly rods and, and all of his gear. Just a lot of fun. And if fly fishing itself doesn't pose a big enough challenge for you, add a human-powered boat to the equation. A fishing with a kayak offers some interesting challenges. I, I've never been a boat boat guy. I, I like the quietness. I'm kind of a quiet sports person. So the kayak fits right into that very perfectly. And you can, it's uh, quite stealthy. It's quiet. You're looking at the bird life around you and, and all this kind of stuff. It just, there's no interference with the mortar. So I just really like it. All these different fish, uh, bird species and listen to loons. It's just been wonderful. You know, I don't know how you could look at life and think it could be any better. And usually, pretty good fishing with it. Kayak fishing's become more popular with the advancements in technology. This is a standard kayak. A lot of people use what's called a fishing kayak, which is a, basically a sit on top and it's much more stable. They're not as easy to, to paddle uh, or maneuver with, I don't think. You might be surprised when you learn that some people want to make it harder for themselves to catch fish. Whether it's using kayaks and fly rods or more primitive gear such as hand augers in the winter. Using traditional equipment, some that's handmade, takes you to a different level in the outdoor world. It can be frustrating or tiring, but in the end you're left with a feeling of accomplishment that can be hard to attain otherwise. When I moved to Minnesota back in 1982, we, uh, I built a cedar strip canoe and I ended up building 18 of them over the years. The first one, it probably cost me about as much beer to make as it did for the wood I used. It was you put a few strips on and sip a sip of beer and look at it and say, oh wow, that's pretty cool. That canoe is now a flower bed. 
I won this kayak in a raffle. Got it for five bucks. With the old cedar strip, I, I was uh, sitting in the middle of it, basically, and uh, with this, I'm doing the same thing, and, and it's a lot easier to maneuver than a, than, a, than a canoe, and you can really get in some really interesting places with it. When it comes to what you can target with that kayak and fly rod, the list is endless. Crappies are really fun on a fly rod. Boy, if you catch one, you'll probably catch 15. They're, they're a lot of fun to catch. And bluegill, I, I love fishing for bluegill, and there's a lot of really nice bluegill lakes around. Fishing isn't always about limits. It's about getting away from it all. Up in the Boundary Waters, I, I was fishing once, and there was a, uh, I saw something swimming, and I thought, I thought it was really interesting because I thought it was a beaver. And then as it got closer to shore, it turned out to be a deer swimming across the, across the lake. And there's just a lot of cool stuff. It's, uh, you just never know what you're gonna see, what you're gonna do. I guess the, the key to me is just, I just love the peacefulness of it. I just, you know, it's, I grew up in the, as a photojournalist, uh, worked for magazines and newspapers and, and was always involved in news stories and, and uh, crowded events and stuff like that. And it's just like, this is, this is like uh, maybe the karma from all of that. So will John fish this way forever? Probably. <laughs> Forever for me may only be another year, who knows? <laughs> I'm not a young guy anymore, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's lovely. With the livestock, or the pasture, um, we do a lot of intensive rotational grazing. In life, I think that's the greatest trick you can have, is if you could learn as you go. We're honoring pheasant, 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 pheasant. Hi, I'm Lisa County, and I love the outdoors to hunt, fish, paddle, hike, and it's all made possible through the abundance of nature. Natural resource organizations work hard to protect our waterways and wildlife habitats, but what can you and I do to make a difference? Prairie Sportsman presents Conservation DIY. Ben Dwyer's 700-acre farm near Arco, Minnesota is a showcase of environmental stewardship. He is diversifying crops, protecting water quality, and using intensive rotational grazing and integrated pest management. We are doing a lot of boots on the ground scouting of our fields. Um, so that way we know what pests we have, we can time our applications if, if we even need them. So we're not just broad spectrum spraying something that we don't need. Um, if, if, if it meets a certain economic threshold where it's harming the crops, we'll step in and do something, but we'll also look for beneficial predators too. Um, so if there's something that's gonna come in naturally and take care of the problem, we won't step in. And the crop and the biggest thing is we've, we've gone, instead of raising just corn and soybeans, we raise corn, soybeans, and small grains. Um, and then also the small grains allows us to incorporate cover crops easier ahead of the corn crop for next year. So it also helps kinda cut down our fertilizer costs, but just, just it breaks up the disease and pest cycle. Probably our, if you wanna call it our centerpiece would be the corn acres. Um, and then we also have wheat, which is usually going to be grown the year of fall or before preceding the corn. Uh, and then we'll put a nitrogen fixing cover crop after the wheat is harvested to help fertilize the corn the year after. Um, following the corn crop, we will raise soybeans. We'll um, uh, plant cereal rye into the corn residue in the fall and then we'll no-till soybeans into that living green cover crop in the spring. We do a lot of red clover. We intercede it with the Sudan grass, so you know it's a nitrogen fixer. We, this year in the field we're in now, it'll be peas, oats, and radishes. Um, the peas will be a nitrogen source. The radishes will help with break up compaction in the field. And then the oats are, it's great for mycorrhizae and kind of a topsoil loosener. With the livestock, or the pasture, um, we do a lot of intensive rotational grazing where we move our cattle every single day or every, you know, sometimes every three days, just depending on where we're at. 
but like if we have a weed pressure system, we will might concentrate the cattle harder in that area so that they're gonna trample those weeds before they go to seed. Or I might maybe move a mineral feeder in that area so that they're just getting more traffic to knock those weeds down so that we don't have to spray it. In the past year, we've been working hard with uh, pollinator habitat too, trying to provide a, you know, a source of pollen for pollinators. And also, we've been trying to promote milkweed production out there for the monarchs. And uh, once you get into mid-September and the migration, you know, the trees out there will just be plastered with, with a lot of monarch butterflies. With so many earth-friendly practices in place, Ben applied to be a water quality certified farm through the Minnesota Department of Agriculture and local certification specialist, Danielle Evers. I work in the 11 counties in southwest Minnesota based out of the Pipestone office and my job is basically to promote the program and work with producers who decide that they want to go through the process. We go over tillage management, nutrient management, conservation practices that they're already implementing on their farm. Uh, we look at the soil type, slope of the land, uh, tile intake and drainage, um, irrigation, just basically a whole broad spectrum. Um, and if they have animals too, we look at the manure management as well. We've had 215 applications and out of those, about 108 certifications. I think one of the main reasons this program is important is for one, just getting farmers educated about what their current practices are like when it comes to the risk that they're posing to water quality. It's really not as scary as a lot of farmers think it is. Um, sometimes tillage is not nearly as necessary as we think it is, um, and that's where a lot of our water and soil erosion problems come from. I have a lot of really, I have a lot of light sandy soils, and I have a lot of marshland, and it can. And the longer you're into no-till, the easier it gets. By year three, you won't even recognize your farm anymore. In our next segment, we pay tribute to our dear friend Kurt Anderson, who departed the earth in January. For more than a decade, Chef Kurt has delighted the Prairie Sportsman audience with his culinary creations, from duck wontons to caramel-crusted rabbit. He made us laugh while he shared his enthusiasm for a great dish. And who will ever forget his colorful chef's coats and hats made lovingly by Bernie, his wife of 35 years. We will miss you, Chef Kurt. Thank you for helping our Minnesota wild game taste so good. Thanks for joining me today. Today is my favorite recipe, and I'm gonna bet it becomes yours too, and I wanna show you from step to step how we're doing that. It's Matt. Where were you uh, born and raised? Evansville, Minnesota. I was actually born in the, uh, it used to be the children's hospital in uh, Alexandria. My wife, was born uh, nearby too. Uh, I married my high school sweetheart. What is ironic though, is that um, both our mothers were just a few rooms apart. And uh, you know, I was born a little later. So she was uh, on the 11th and I'm the 14th. And uh, so it's kind of funny. Both moms were in the hospital at the same time. We didn't really get to look that up till we had our first child. So that was kind of funny. And because of the way I was born, uh, I, I guess I was a blue baby. Uh, not a Smurf, but you know, born a, born a blue baby. And uh, my daughter in show and tell or whatever at school when she was very young, she explained to everybody that I was born a blueberry. So I was, I've had an interesting uh, growing up, so to, you know, from a blueberry to what I am now, I'm like a giant plum almost. Well, I'm M&M &M today, but I mean, you know what I mean? So it's been quite a, quite a movement. So you've been uh, working with Prairie Sportsman for a few years? Many years. It's been over 10 years when I got involved with you uh, people, and it's been a joy having done it, uh, simply because of the people I got to meet. Uh, and, and, you know, the hate not hateful, but the unique thing when you put yourself out there like that is the stories you get to hear, uh, the things you learn from the people. Uh, I remember the first time I met uh, Mr. Massey is a perfect example and uh, how he could laugh a joke around and then later I find out that he's, 
you know, a teacher and all the stuff he's done in his life and then what his kids have done and seen. And then uh, through work, I'd get customers that would come and, hey, you get to work, uh, you've been with this fellow and he did this for me. And uh, you, you uh, really get to see a picture of how one person can make a difference in a whole pile of people. And that, that's, so, that's so fun to see. Oh, yeah, um, and ironically, it seems to be my voice, you know, and I know, uh, I know you're probably saying, you know, I got a voice for uh, uh, <laughs> newspaper and a face for radio, but the, the thing we had, we were on vacation two years ago, and we're in Kentucky, and I wanted to eat at this little establishment before we went through the mountains. Uh, they had their own trout, trout pond, and the river come by, and I thought, boy, well, that's gonna taste good. And uh, so the hostess is warning us that we're gonna have about a 45 minute wait or longer. So we're sitting out in front of the place, having just having a beer, relaxing, and she comes out and says, hey, there's a table that would like you to join them. And as it turns out, your program, which when it's sent up to space, holy smokes, it reaches a lot of places. And they recognize the voice first, and then obviously these this handsome good looks, you know. And then, uh, and the next thing I know, we spent uh, an entertaining three and a half hours sitting there eating fish, talking food, talking experiences, talking stories. And it enriched our vacation because that happened, the six days we were gone, it happened four days out of the trip uh, between there and all the way to Branson. And it was in a very, very enjoyable experience. Uh, I had one instance in Utah when we went to visit my daughter in college. And we got off the plane and we're walking back into the uh, main terminal and a young man calls me by name and uh, I thought you know he maybe is looking at the seating chart he works for the airline and uh, so I said hey thanks you know I'm just gonna visit he says yeah my dad watches you all the time on Prairie Sportsman and he was from this area and his son worked out there and I, th I thought that was I, I thought that was nice because you, you just especially nowadays you know how they always say the world is smaller than you think it is and man it really is you know, that pe people, they visit, they got something to talk about, and it's, that's fun to see, fun to see. So it's not such a bad thing for you to grow up in sports? <laughs> well, no, it isn't. I will say that I do enjoy, uh, I do enjoy uh, when you allow me to, to cook, uh, and I'll cook for everybody that uh, may be there, or maybe helping out, or representing in some fashion, or, uh, is helping answer telephones. That's a that's a really entertaining time because then again you get the fellowship of, of just the being together, everybody talking, learn the stuff you learn, the stories you hear, and it's opened up relationships for me uh, to people that I just you know I didn't know. There was so much I didn't know. We'll just say that you always learn, always learn. So what about your uh, colorful? Well, I know, you know, people are probably sick of seeing that, but, uh, you know, as fortunate as I am to have married my tailor, uh, the rule is I get to pick any of the outside material. However, I am not qualified enough to pick the appropriate buttons or the inside lining material. That I can't do, you know, and she does such a wonderful job at that. Uh, she happened to find a pattern that was uh, my size, if you can believe that. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it takes three, just over three yards to cover all of this. And that makes the matching hat too. So I'm pr pretty proud about that. <laughs> pretty proud about that. <laughs> How many do you have? We have 38 now. I actually had to count the last time we taped. I have several Christmas ones as well. So I have 38 different uh, uniforms. And uh, my wife has told me that uh, coming up here, I'm to thin out five or six. So they'll become uniforms that I'll use when I'm gonna mow lawn at the church or something like that outside so I don't sunburn. You know, you, it takes a lot to keep this looking that nice. 
I need plenty of rest and I need to make sure I don't get too much sun. You know, I never did tell you that my family crest is a megaphone. Did I ever tell you that? That's, yeah, it's hard to believe, you know, as shy and quiet as I am. But uh, yeah, that's true too. Is that a family trait? That's, every, yeah, 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 I think you could, uh, you know, my father even bought snow jet snowmobiles back in the day. And uh, I gotta be honest, you know, they were a very loud snowmobile to, to ride on. Those that have them know that they were loud. I could still hear my father no matter where I was when he <laughs> hollered that I was to get my hiney back home. Uh, so yeah, I inherited that trait too, you know. Microphone, you know, I always laugh when you guys mic me up because I'm pretty sure everybody could hear me no matter where I would, would be hollering from. <laughs> yeah, why are we, why are you using that microphone? So yeah, so that's kind of nice. I can usually, I've, I've enjoyed it, but more than that, think of what I've learned. Think of what I got to do. Think of the people I got to meet. Uh, that I got to see, the stories I got to hear. Uh, now when I travel, and uh, you know, and I chase a lot. I put, on, I put on a lot of miles even on the motorcycle in the summertime in between uh, working other jobs because I, it's fun to see, it's fun to see the area, you see the states. So we drive a lot because I want to see that, but it never fails. You stop, you get to see somebody that maybe watches the program, and then you get to talk, and all of a sudden you learn little tricks, uh, things they may have done, and I try to share some of that that I that I get to find out, and and uh, you know I think in the end, think of all the stuff that we maybe could be eating that we don't eat, you know that we just think it's not uh, not up to par or something we don't like. That's my biggest pet peeve is when you say there's something you don't like. You, you might have gotten a bad experience on something at, at some point, but boy, I tell you what, you gotta keep trying it because there's, there's, there's stuff out there, it's that good. You know, and they'll say, hey, don't ever eat this carp or you know, don't ever eat these uh, hell divers or these mud hens or some of the stuff that I've made, it's good stuff and it's tough to tell the difference. You have to use some of these old tricks to get get certain flavors out of it so that it, it, it comes in. But, you know, and that's, in life, I think that's the greatest trick you can have is if you could learn as you go, share that with others, and then it brings us all together as a group again. In October, the Prairie Sportsman crew spent a day filming Chef Kurt cooking up new wild game and fish dishes. While we didn't know it would be our last day with Kurt, we're fortunate that we can share his last food creations with you. Hey, thanks for jumping in here. Today, I have a treat for you. We're honoring pheasant. Pheasant, pheasant, pheasant. I've taken uh, breasts from a pheasant. I've made a special marinade. This was the year of marinades for me to try to flavor stuff. I played a lot with that. I want to show you what they look like when they're done. It'll be like this, where they've marinated for more than four hours. You could marinate overnight, but it'll taste just like the marinade only. Now, when I pour in the marinade with the pheasant, as this bubbles, it's going to reduce and it'll eventually disappear. Okay, so you have to watch that just a little bit because if you get it too done, then it's going to get all black on you. And I've had, we've all had that happen before. Going over to this direction today, my lunch is going to consist of uh, this pheasant and the rice. I need a little bit of a garnish right on the top. So in this case, you're just going to see a little bit of green onion go on there. It's going to have a bit of an oriental feel to this lunch. And this is one of my favorites. Now, if I take my fancy dancy rice here, just white, and I'm going to give me two portions. So me and my pumpkin can have a little bit. We celebrated our 35th wedding anniversary. That poor girl's had to put up with me a long time. So now today she gets to put up with this. Nice sharp knife. I've always been in the habit of trying to cut my meat on the bias 
and very thin, especially my wild game. Uh, you know, sometimes that muscular meat can be very, uh, you know, and being so lean could get tough otherwise. So I'm trying to be very careful. I know my sweetie likes hers nicely done. As you can see, very pretty just for her. There we go. So we're making our, uh, we'll call it our anniversary uh, lunch right here. A little bit of scallion for her, a little bit for me. And that'll be good for us there. And that's in honor of the pheasant, of the wild game that we can get right here on the farm. And I bet you can too. Go out there, take a shot at it, hunt a little bit, enjoy, be safe, be careful, and give it a try. Enjoy now. Funding for this program was provided by the Minnesota Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund, Safe Basements of Minnesota, your basement waterproofing and foundation repair specialist since 1990. Peace of mind is a safe basement. Diamond Willow Advanced Care Assisted Living, providing custom homes with smaller settings designed especially for high care needs. Live wide open telling stories of why people have chosen to live wide open in West Central Minnesota. More at livewideopen.com. Western Minnesota Prairie Waters, quietly beautiful and wildly connected. As you can see here, there's a fascinating creature known as the Dylan Kirkman. Oh, there he waves. He's, we've been spotted. We've been spotted. We gotta, we gotta run. He's very dangerous. If he charges, the man-eater. Just, just look at him. 